Hey guys, Sheephead here with another video from Final Fantasy XIV, and today we're going to be jumping back into the binding core of Bahumat, and we're going to be looking at a boss guide for Turn 2, also known as the ADS. So before we get started, I'd just like to point out that I did reach 10,000 subscribers yesterday, and I have been doing a giveaway, and I will be announcing the winner at the end of this video. Okay, so let's start with the boss tactics for Turn 2. The first thing that you're going to notice upon entering Turn 2 is the fact that the main room is split up into seven different sectors. As you guys can see on screen, this is the map for the zone, and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. All the sectors, apart from number 6, are going to contain mini-bosses, and every individual mini-boss is going to have its own set of skills, and while it's alive, it's going to lend one of its main skills to the main boss, and once it's killed, it's also going to place a buff on the main boss. So the whole idea in these first 6 sectors is that you want to go through and kill off the mini-bosses which have the most devastating abilities to make the fight as easy as you possibly can. Now ideally, you would like to go around and kill up all 6 of these mini bosses. However, upon entering Sector 1, you are greeted with this emote which says Charge Complete in 12 clicks. Basically what this means, is that every 1 minute that goes past, another charge is going to be complete. And when this hits 0, i.e. 12 minutes from the start, the boss is going to explode and kill everyone in the vicinity. So in short, you have 12 minutes from the moment that you enter Sector 1 until the boss is dead, otherwise you wipe. So due to the time limit that you have, it's recommended that you only kill 3 of the 6 mini bosses, as this is going to give you enough time to kill the main boss as well. So when we kill this boss, we obviously start in Sector 1. Once we've killed that, we go down to Sector 3, and then we finish up with the final mini boss in Sector 5. So I'm now going to go over the first 3 mini bosses that we encounter, and then I will explain the abilities that the remaining 3 mini bosses have. So as you guys can see on screen, we're in the first sector, and this is going to be home to the monitoring node. Now before we get started, I'd just like to outline the three main abilities that are going to happen for every single mini boss, and for the main boss himself. So the first ability, as you guys can see on screen, is this massive AoE circle that is in melee range, and it's called Repelling Cannons. So simply, as soon as you see the cast bar for this, you want to turn around and run out if you're in melee range. Now if you do get hit by this, it hits you for about 1.5k damage. The second ability, as you guys can see, is this cast called High Voltage. Now simply put, this is going to happen every 15 seconds, and it needs to be interrupted. If you do not interrupt this, everyone in the party is going to take about 900 damage and they also are going to get a 30 second debuff called Paralysis, which cannot be dispelled. So if you do get Paralysis, it's pretty much a wipe, seeing as the debuff is going to stop you from casting every 2 seconds. If this does happen, your tank's going to die due to lack of heals, or you're simply going to miss the interrupts on the next high voltage. So the best way to deal with this is to sort out an interrupt rotation, in which you have at least 3 or 4 players. As you guys can see here, I was first in the interrupt rotation, and after I'm done, we're going to use the second bard in our group, and if we do have any problems, we have a Paladin tank who is ready to pick up any interrupts if we accidentally 1, die, or 2, use our cooldowns at the wrong time. Just for a small bard side note here with your interrupts, it's a great idea that if you're next on the interrupt rotation, you hold off from using any off-global cooldown skills such as Bloodletter. If you do happen to use Bloodletter off the global cooldown, you're going to be put on animation cooldown, and it's going to delay your blunt arrow to the point where you're going to miss the cast, and you're going to wipe the raid. So the third ability is a tank stacking debuff, and it's going to require you to switch your tanks every so often. As you guys can see here on screen, the tank who is tanking the miniboss is going to get this debuff called Vulnerability Up. This debuff lasts 24 seconds, and it's going to increase his physical damage taken. Now the tank is going to gain a new stack about every 6 or 7 seconds, and I recommend you tank switch every 5 stacks, seeing as this damage can be healed through, and it's also going to give the first tank enough time to lose his debuffs before he tanks again. So just to recap, these 3 abilities will be used on every single mini boss, and the main boss himself. Now this monitoring node does have a special ability, which is called Vacuum Wave. However, it does not happen on any other mini boss, but it will happen on the final boss himself. So the vacuum wave, as you guys can see here, cannot be avoided, and it's going to hit everyone in the party. Basically, it's only going to tick for 300 damage, and it's going to tick every 5 seconds. So it's not too much to worry about, and you just heal through it. So as you guys can see, after we kill the monitoring node, 
we're going to go down the ramp and we're going to go to sector three. Just as another small side note, it's probably a good idea to run Mana Song just before the mini boss dies so that you have full mana ready to start the next mini boss. So as you guys can see, the second node is called the defense node and he's going to have the same three abilities as I said previously. He's going to start with repelling cannons, he's then going to do high voltage and he's also going to be applying one stack of vulnerability up to your tank every six or seven seconds. So the special ability that the defense node has is a chain lightning. As you guys can see here, it hit me for about 2,000 damage. And all you have to do is just spread out to minimize the damage that is taken by Chain Lightning. Just to recap, by killing the defense node, you are going to remove the Chain Lightning ability from the final boss. So after we've killed the defense node, we're actually going to move over to Sector 6, which contains the next mini boss called the Disposal Node. So yet again, he has the repelling cannons, he has the high voltage, he's going to be applying the tank switching debuff, and also he has a special ability called Firestream. So as you guys can see here, this is what Firestream looks like. And it's this big red X formation. Now this does have a cast time, however it's like 0.2 seconds, so you can barely see it coming. So you just need to be prepared and ready to move out of the X. Now if you do get hit by this, it's going to do 1.5k damage, and it's also going to put a dot on you called Firestream that's going to do 300 damage per tick. One thing that I'd also like to point out is the fact that this attack can be done at the same time as repelling cannons. So if you're melee, you not only need to be ready to dodge the X formation, but you need to be ready to run away from the boss as well. So yet again, by killing the disposal node, we have now removed Firestream from the final boss. So as you guys can see, we've now made it to the final boss, which is called ADS. I'm now going to go over the boss's normal abilities, and then I will cover the three special abilities, which the boss will be able to do, seeing as we did not kill the other three nodes, which was the quarantine node, the attack node, and the sanitary node. So the first thing that's going to happen is the boss is going to start by ticking away with his vacuum wave. As you guys know by now, this ticks for 300 damage, and you can't avoid it, so you just need to heal through it. The second ability that's going to happen is going to be the high voltage. So make sure that you have your interrupters ready to get this and you have your interrupt rotation sorted out before you start the fight. The next ability that happens is going to be a new one and it's called piercing laser. As you guys can see here, the boss is going to target this massive red line on the floor and you simply just want to move out of it. If you do get hit by it, it's going to deal about 2 to 3k damage. And if this happens just before a tick of vacuum wave, then you're simply dead. So try and avoid this at all costs. So after the piercing laser, the next ability that's going to happen is going to be the repelling cannons. And as you guys know, the melee just need to run away and not get hit by this. So I'd just like to point out that these three abilities are going to happen in the same order throughout the entire fight. So it's going to be high voltage, piercing laser, and then repelling cannons. At the same time as all this, you have the tank debuff, which is called vulnerability up, which is going to be happening every six to seven seconds. So make sure that your tanks are communicating and they're going to be tank switching every five stacks. Now, let's move on to the special abilities. So every 25%, the boss is going to gain a new ability from one of the remaining nodes that we didn't kill from sectors two, four, or seven. So as you guys can see here, when we hit 75%, the quarantine node is going to spawn up for a split second. Now you do not need to damage this down and the boss is simply going to absorb it. Once absorbed, he's going to gain the ability from the quarantine node, which is called Alagon Rot. As you guys can see on screen, when the boss casts this, he's going to place a debuff called Alagon Rot on one player. This debuff is going to last 15 seconds and at first glance it's not going to do anything. However, when this debuff hits zero, the player who has it is going to blow up and kill everyone in the room. So to avoid everyone blowing up when the debuff hits zero, all you have to do is pass on the debuff by moving through another player. As you guys can see here, I have Alagon Rot and it's about to hit 5 seconds, which is the time at which we decided to pass on the debuff. So I'm simply going to move to the middle of the room and I'm going to run through another player, thus giving them the debuff. They are then going to get a 15 second Alagon Rot, which they will then need to pass on within the next 15 seconds. And the player who passed it on is going to get a 40 second debuff, which means they are immune to Alagon Rot and thus they cannot pick the debuff up again for the next 40 seconds. So as you guys can see on screen, before we start the fight, we set up a rotation in which we are going to pass on the debuff. And we actually mark these players with the in-game marking system. So we're going to put them from 1 to 5. After we've done this, we then pre-assign where players will be standing once we start the fight. So as you can see, we have markers 1 to 4 in a semicircle around the edge of the room, and we have number 5 directly in the center. So when the boss casts Alagon Rot, it can be placed on any player. So for example, if it's on me, number four, I'm going to wait till my debuff hits about five seconds 
and I'm going to move to player number 5, who is Meow Meow in the centre of the room. 10 seconds later, when Meow Meow's debuff hits 5 seconds, he's going to move to number 1, then number 1 will move to number 2, and so on. Now in the unfortunate case that one of the tanks manages to get the Alagon Rot debuff, it's a good idea that you have one melee DPS, run in and grab it for them, and pass it out to number 5, or number 1 if number 5 has the debuff already. After another 25% of health, the boss is going to gain another ability at 50%, and he's going to take this one from the attack node. As you guys can see on screen, this ability is called Gravity Field, and it has an insanely fast cast time, so I believe it cannot be interrupted. As you guys can see, this is what Gravity Field looks like. It's just this purple void zone on the floor. Now, if you do get hit by this, it's going to slow you down, and it's going to do a damage over time ability, which deals about 500 damage per tick. So basically, all you want to do is move out of this as soon as possible, seeing as the slow debuff can be problematic when you need to pass on your debuff of Alagon Rot, or you need to avoid any of the AoE in the fight. So now we're moving on to the final special ability of the boss, which is going to be gained from the Sanitary node when the boss reaches 25%. So as you can see, this ability is called Ballast, and the best way to describe it is a Pac-Man shaped 3 zoned AoE. Now if you do get hit by this, it's going to deal about 1.5k damage, and it's also going to knock you back, which can cause a lot of problems when we're passing the Alagon Rot debuff. So the best way to deal with this is to 1. Tank the boss in the very corner of the room, as you guys can see we've been doing this the entire fight, as it does maximise space for the rest of the room. By doing this, it means that the ranged can max range the boss, and thus when Ballast comes, they can simply move back 2 or 3 steps to avoid getting hit. Now seeing as the AoE is in 3 tiers and it's absolutely massive, the melee simply do not have the time to run out of the AoE, so they have to find the cutout in the shape, i.e. Pac-Man's mouth. As you guys can see here, this 90 degree cutout is the safe zone, you simply need to find this and you will be fine. So this fight is relatively hard in my opinion, and it's pretty much all about communication. Everyone needs to be on Mumble or TeamSpeak or whatever, and you really need to keep track of who is next in interrupt rotation, who has Alagon Rot, and who is getting it next. I recommend that you save your level 3 limit break, and you get a damage dealer to use it towards the end of the fight, seeing as the final 25% of the fight are by far the hardest, as he has all three special abilities going on at once. So guys, this is going to be the end of my Binding Core of Bahumat Turn 2 guide. If you have any questions about the fight or any suggestions for my channel, then please put them in the comment section below, as I will reply to every single comment on my video. Other than that, if you like this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of my content that I have on Final Fantasy XIV. Now before I go, I just have to announce the winner of the 60 day time card for Final Fantasy XIV, as I did hit 10,000 subscribers yesterday, and this is for the giveaway. So as you guys can see on screen, the winner is Celestial Beast. All you have to do is PM me and I will reply with your 60 day time card code. So guys, thanks for watching this video. I wish you the best of luck in the binding core of Bahuma and I'll see you guys on Monday. So as you can see, if I just handed in the 10 normal quality mistletoes, I'd have got 26,400. However, by making these all high quality, I gain an extra 13,200 experience.